OK. So welcome to today's class. We'll make a fair amount of progress on kernels and optimization. So basically, today, we're going to do more support vector machine, support vector regression, maybe novelty detection, depending on how time goes. But before I do that, I should, of course, point out the lucky winners of this time's homework. So Angry Bird, Homework 4, Alada, Perfect Totient, and Shein scored. OK, so of course, the top 10 get bonus points, but they also get chocolates. So is an Angry Bird in the room? Uh, OK, is Angry Bird in the room? Uh, how about Homework 4? Oh, wow. Well, how about Elada? <laughs> is any one of the five lucky winners here in the room? Man, this is ridiculous. <laughs> number You're number six. OK, Frodo. So it's your turn. Explain to us how you did it. And let's give a round of applause to Frodo. OK, why don't you come up here? Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to say that I did get some help from the panel over there. So we, we kind of worked together on this. So uh, that's cool. Yeah, so I just want to give him a little shout out because I didn't do it all myself. But uh, uh, so basically, uh, L1 normalization of the data followed by standard. Well, actually, it was standardization first. Subtract the mean and, sub and divide by the standard deviation, and then divide the data. Uh, normalize each row by the L1 norm. For some reason, doing it. Dividing the columns by the L1 norm, uh, normalizing the features didn't work for me, but normalizing the, the actual data points by the L1 norm uh, using RBF kernel and just searching for the right bandwidth. So that's pretty much it. Just uh, data standardization followed by L1 normalization of the rows and uh, RBF kernel. Okay, cool. Yeah. Th thank you. Okay. So I think for that, Frodo also will definitely deserve some chocolates. So thanks. Um, so I guess what you've already seen from homework two and homework four so far is that data pre-processing actually really makes a difference, right? So if your data is poorly scaled in some strange way, then you are more likely than not to run into an issue. And that's actually something that also happens a lot in reality. So there are actually algorithms which deal with this specifically. One of them is called automatic relevance determination. So look for something called ARD. Okay. So this is by Radford Neal. So by the way, if you think my handwriting is horrible, I agree, it looks absolutely horrific on here. This has a lot to do with the font smoothing that uh, iOS supplies when you write on it. So my handwriting is bad in, by default, but it's a lot worse on here. So apologies for that. Um, I'm going to try the different stylus. Um, the other thing is homework uh, corrections and feedback is, will be coming forward. Um, so thanks for letting me know that this hasn't happened as much as it should have so far. Um, this will be addressed. Okay, good. Um, so I guess, oh, okay, what's that question? Is the extra period awarded only till 9 a.m. or does the competition go on till? Is what? Is the, is the extra period for the top 10? Okay, so the leaderboard was extracted. So I did this this morning at 8.35 in the morning. Right. So just before I came uh, here uh, to teach this class. Um, if the leaderboard should have changed in the past 25 minutes, I would not know it. We can, ch we can check. Let's check and see whether the leaderboard has changed in the past. No. The leaderboard is exactly the same as before. <coughs> okay. Somebody else uploaded one more try and it didn't do it. So still the same leaderboard. OK. Um, yeah. OK, 
Okay, any other questions? So the lecture for next Wednesday, so basically, uh, is up being uploaded right now. It should have been up already, but then the CMU Wi-Fi died, and uh, so it's re-uploading right now. Um, Mansil will also teach this class here live, so you can either watch it online or you can come to the lecture or do both, and then you'll probably find out that Mansil will do a much greater job than me. So enjoy his uh, part. Okay. Um, so, kernels, um, let's just briefly recap what we did uh, last Wednesday. And this is just going to be very quick until we get to the point where things are new. So remember, the issue was that if you want to solve x or, well, then good luck trying to do this here because any linear separator isn't really going to do a terribly good job. It will always get one wrong. You can't win here. So obviously, if you move to a high dimensional space, then you can go and, you know, find a separating hyperplane here, and that neatly separates, well, the purple triangles from the green circles, so these will end up above, and the other guys will be below, and yeah, we did that. And then we formalized this by saying, well, okay, let's actually design some quadratic features, and, sorry. These quadratic features basically, sorry, I know. Um, these quadratic features basically can be easily computed by taking inner products and then squaring terms. And it turns out to be the case that this is not only true for quadratic features, but basically works for any polynomials of order d via this thing here. Now, if, has anybody here done group theory. Awesome. So then you probably know a little bit about representations of groups, so special unitary group, so SUN. So in other words, the group of rotations. Those of you who have done physics would probably know it from the states of the electron in hydrogen, because basically the corresponding eigenfunctions correspond to exactly the eigenfunctions for in the irreducible representation. But the point being, <clears throat> if you use group theory, you can actually prove that this feature map here, this one here, is the only reasonable feature map that you can design if you want to get homogeneous polynomial features of, from your data. And you want to make sure that under rotations of the data, the features that you're going to extract and the principal components and all the things remain invariant. So sometimes this type of invariance arguments is extremely powerful to show that out of a large class of possible solutions, there's only a tiny set of solutions that you could possibly uh, really want to look at. So this can help you a lot to prove that your simple solution is actually a good and principled one. Um, that's just as an aside. Then, yeah, we watch that video, and <clears throat> then we basically asked, you know, can we do this thing computationally efficiently overall? And the key point here is that kernels are a good idea whenever this operation here, the kernel part itself, is much cheaper to compute than computing those feature maps. And this was a very, very powerful paradigm that lasted for about 20 years at least, where people took all sorts of linear methods and kernelized them by basically replacing wherever inner products happened, then by kernels. What has been happening <coughs> as of late is a move back to the original features. A lot of the reason of why this happens is that if you use kernels, then you will end up using more kernels if you have more data. And that actually makes a lot of the algorithms computationally very expensive. So this is why at the moment a lot of work is going back into constructing these things here very efficiently and cheaply and then working directly back on that explicit feature space. Okay. <clears throat> now, the first thing to do then is that you can ask, well, is there something like a kernel perceptron 
And yes, there is, and it's actually very simple. So remember the perceptron was basically one where we took our weight vector and we added all the instances to it that we got wrong. So somebody asked on Piazza <clears throat> what the intuition behind the perceptron is. Well, basically all you're going to do is you're just going to store all the mistakes that you made, and you're going to learn how to do things correctly by remembering all the things that you got wrong and what you should have done instead, which I think is kind of a natural way of going about things. So think of <clears throat> if you make no mistakes ever in you know, your research, then you're basically probably not pushing it hard enough, right? If everything is completely predictable and if you always know exactly what's going to happen, well, then you're probably doing extremely boring research because you're not taking any risks. Of course, if you end up making mistakes at every step and nothing ever works, then maybe you're being a little bit crazy ambitious or maybe you should change fields. <laughs> but basically making no mistakes is not a very effective way of learning. And that's actually also the case for the perceptron. So you might an ask yourself, you know, how can I actually accept, uh, accelerate the perceptron learning? Because until I've really made all of those mistakes, until I've found something that satisfies all the constraints, I'm not done yet. So basically all those instances where I'm getting things right are kind of wasted time, right? They are fine if I actually use them to predict something, like betting on the stock market, but they're a bad idea if all I do is, oh yeah, another instance that I already knew what to do with. So you can actually then use all sorts of nice aggregation techniques to very quickly skip over sets of data that are boring. So things like core sets are actually quite effective there. Okay. Now, we already had the perceptron on features, where basically rather than x, we went to phi of x. And now all we're doing is we are going from x dot x prime to k of x and x prime. Right? That's basically all we're doing. <clears throat> and so this means that we cannot explicitly maintain the weight vector w anymore. But the only thing we can do is we can maintain that k is given by, you know, a sum of points in feature space, and so therefore I get those kernels. Right. We'll actually go through this in a bit more detail, don't worry. Um, and so the algorithm is ridiculously simple. The only thing is that now, when you actually compute the prediction, you need to sum over all the terms here, right? There we go. Yeah. So you basically need to sum over all the instances that you got wrong. But now you don't really explicitly work out the phi of xi's anymore, but you now take just the inner product between the phi of xi's and x, and so you get sum over yi k of xi and x plus b. That's you know, a fairly straightforward, simple algorithm. It's really query and replaced by Emacs. As a matter of fact, that's how I, uh, you know, typed up this algorithm by just taking the original one and just performing a query replace of those two red lines. There's nothing else there. Okay. Any questions so far? This is not trivial. And as a matter of fact, that's an idea that basically generated maybe about 100 papers over one to two decades. So it, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not a horribly uh, difficult idea, but it's a, it's a new concept. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Good. Um, so basically what happens is, well, you take the original data that you can't really solve, you map the data into some higher dimensional space where the problem is nicely solvable, and then you build, let's say, a perceptron based on that, right? So it's very, very simple. Um, so before we go on, maybe I should quickly go through 
a few more examples of how you can have fun with kernels. So the simplest thing that you can do is you can ask, okay, so if I have x being mapped into phi of x, right, and I have k of x and x prime to be the inner product between phi of x prime and phi of x, I can ask, you know, what is the length of phi of x? Does somebody have an idea of how to compute this? Yep. Uh, square root of kxx. Exactly. And the reason is because this can be written as the inner product between phi of x and phi of x, which is just k of x and x. And from that, we can also infer that k of x and x prime, k of x and x always has to be greater or equal than zero. So a very quick thing that you can do to check whether something is a kernel is you just check whether it's, you know, greater or equal than zero. So you check whether the main diagonal is non-negative. If you have even just a single negative entry, you know that this function k cannot be a kernel. This is not a sufficient condition, but it's necessary. Okay. Um, the next thing that I can do is, and this was exactly what we used for the perceptron, if I have w equals sum over some weighting coefficients, I'm just generalizing it a little bit because we'll need that later on anyway, i equals 1 to m, alpha i, phi of x i. So then I can go and, and of course I know that these alpha i's are just in r. So then I can go and do things like compute the inner product between w and phi of x. That is nothing else but the inner product between sum over i going from 1 to m, alpha i, phi of x i, and phi of x. This is really just plugging in the definition. Let's go here. And now, I can, of course, move the sum out of the inner product. That's just because of bilinearity. So this thing here moves out here. So do the alphas. Okay. Once those two terms move out, I simply get sum over i going from 1 to m, alpha i, inner product between phi of x i and phi of x. And that thing here, of course, is nothing else than k of x i and x. Okay, so this is our kernel expansion. So there's actually a very useful theorem that we'll encounter later, which is called the representer theorem. This is by Kimmeldorf and Waba. This was the first version, and there have been at least 10 papers that have generalized this representative theorem in one way or another, or simplified the proof. And it basically tells you that in many cases, you will end up solving for a function in a larger space by getting this kernel expansion. We'll get to that in more detail, but that's basically what Grace Weber did during her PhD. Now, a couple of useful things that you can do is, 
Well, just like we computed the norm of r of x, we can compute the norm of w. So let's do that. So remember, w was sum over i going from 1 to m phi of x i alpha i. And so the norm of w, let's square it, is nothing else than w in a product with w, right? Which, of course, I can now use bilinearity to pull out the alphas and the sums. So I get the sum over i and j, alpha i, alpha j, in a product between phi of x i and phi of x j. Because all I've done is I've just plugged my definition of w into each of those terms. And then I've exploited linearity in the first and second argument. So it's exactly the same thing as when we before computed the value of f of x. But now I'm just applying it to the left and right hand side of the inner product. Now once you do that, you can again realize that this is nothing else than k of xi xj. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to define this to be kij. Okay. So in other words, this is nothing else than vector. These are the alphas times matrix times vector. Okay. Now, since the alphas were arbitrary, what does that tell me about k? Yes. So that's exactly the right answer. K has to be positive semi-definite. In other words, all the eigenvalues of k have to be greater or equal than 0. So first of all, we immediately can see that this k here is a symmetric matrix, right? Because k of xi and xj equals k of xj xi. Because it's an inner product, and the inner product itself is symmetric. Right? <laughs> to see that the eigenvalues of k have to be all greater or equal than 0 is also very easy. because if I had some pair, let's say, lambda i, v i, then I could simply go and set alpha equals v i. And then, of course, I get v i transposed k v i equals, well, lambda i. And since I know that this has to be greater or equal than 0, I'm done. And of course, if all the eigenvalues are greater or equal than 0, this condition that this is always that this is non-negative also has to hold, right? Because for a symmetric matrix, the eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis, so this is very easy to obtain. And so I can always write more generally alpha equals, you know, some beta j vj. And by orthogonality, of course, I would get that alpha transposed k alpha is sum over i and j, beta i, beta j, vi transposed k vj. And this is nothing else than just, well, delta ij lambda i, and so we get that this is nothing else than sum over i beta i squared lambda i. So this was a very quick refresher on positive semi-definite matrices, non-negativity, and all that goes with it. So in theory, this should be totally unsurprising 
if you went to the recitations. In practice, I hope it was not so surprising either. Okay, any questions so far? Sorry, this was again a fair amount of algebra, but yeah, you need math to do statistics. Okay, any, no questions? Everything clear? Cool. Okay, good. So, now the game is, how do we actually compute and show that for, yes? Uh, could you give the bigger picture of what were we just doing here? Oh, okay. So what we were doing here was first of all, I was trying to unscare you guys from using kernels. That's the first thing. Second thing is I introduced the kernel matrix, k of x, i, and x, j, which is a central object to a lot of the things that we'll be doing for the rest of this class. Third, I try to show a couple of useful properties. So for instance, the trick that we use bar linearity. Secondly, that we have that kernel matrices are all positive semi-definite. And also that all positive semi-definite matrices could be used as kernel matrices. And furthermore, we computed a couple of useful quantities. So the norm of a vector, or rather the squared norm of a vector, is something that is used very commonly in the context of regularization. Basically, this is used as a way of keeping functions simple. Okay. So that's sort of kind of the motivation of why we're doing this. So I figured that just looking at things in the abstract, like here, was maybe not quite as intuitive as I would hope it to be otherwise. So we made things more concrete by adding more math, right? Hmm. Don't worry, we'll go through a work through example later on. <laughs> okay. So let's actually see what happens, for instance, for polynomial kernels. If we want to show that, you know, k of x dot x prime plus c <clears throat> raised to the power of d is a kernel, then I can do this quite easily. I can basically just go and expand this, right? This is, you know, algebra 101, as in, oh, sorry, calculus 101. That's what it's called here. Um, and so I just get, you know, those inner products here, x to the x prime to the i, c to the d minus i. Okay. And then what I've actually done is I've exploited a couple of useful properties about kernels. Um, well, actually, we might as well look at them later on in a bit more detail. What I actually exploited is that if I have two kernels, then their sum is also a kernel. And that's very easy to see because all I do is I basically just take one vector and I pad it with another vector, just extend it. Let's say I have a five-dimensional vector and a 10-dimensional vector. I just concatenate them and I treat this now as a new vector. And so this new object now well, of course, if I take an inner product between that and another one amount to taking an inner product between the first half here and the second half, right? And that's effectively what I used when proving that the polynomial kernel here is a kernel. Because basically, I'm relying on the fact that each of those individual terms is a kernel. And then I'm summing over kernels, so it also has to be a kernel. So the kernels actually form what's called a convex cone, right? Because what happens is that if I have two kernels, let's actually go through that in a bit more detail. So, fun things that you can do with kernels. Well, one thing that you could do is, you could just have some kernel k 
of x and x prime. It's a happy kernel in its own right. And I go and transform it into alpha times k of x and x prime, where alpha is greater or equal than 0. And that is a kernel, right? It's a kernel because all I've done is I've transformed phi of x into square root alpha times phi of x. So I just rescale all the vectors. Okay. Another thing that I can do is I could have, you know, k of x and x prime plus alpha, where again alpha is greater or equal than zero. Is this a kernel? Actually it is, and here's a simple way how you can construct it. I transform phi of x into phi of x and square root alpha. So I'm just adding one dimension. And so therefore now the inner product between this and you know another term with x prime will give me exactly this function here. So what you're already seeing is that proving that certain operations keep you in kernel land is, is very easy by just you know, explicitly constructing what these operations do to the feature map. So the, this is way easier than otherwise just proving general theorems. So whenever you can, do, whenever you can you know, get your hands explicitly on what this operation does, life's really good for you. So another thing that I can do is I can have some kernel k of x and x prime plus another kernel l of x and x prime. And all this does is it just maps phi of x into phi of x and let's say psi of x. Let's say the psi comes from l and the phi comes from k. Any questions here so far? Um, another thing that you can do, and this is a little bit harder to see, is that k of x and x prime times l of x and x prime is a kernel. Okay. So for matrices, this means that if I have two positive semi-definite matrices, of the same size, and I pointwise multiply them, so this is the MATLAB dot star notation, then the matrix that I'm getting out of this is again going to be positive semi-definite. Okay. Um, can somebody see how you could possibly get that result? This is a bit more tricky. Yes? Well, the necessary condition of the diagonal elements being positive would be easy. That's easy? Yes. But, so, that, that's a very good sanity check. And by the way, the other good sanity check that you should do is you should just simulate it. So, I remember at some point, many years ago, ago a very, very smart colleague of mine who shall remain unnamed told me that, yeah, he had figured out a very, very nice kernel and, you know, things sort of kind of worked and the math was almost done and he was just stuck at one point in a proof. And, but he thought he had it done. And I thought this, the kernel didn't look like a kernel and rather than using any intelligence, I just simulated things and I just generated a couple of random kernel matrices and within about a minute I had a counterexample for him. And if he'd done that four days earlier, he would have saved himself four days. So in many cases, the morale of the story is really perform a very quick sanity check of your model before you go and build a lot. Because sometimes your intuition may be wrong. And as you can easily see why I didn't mention the name of the guy, because he's actually a very smart guy otherwise, but yeah, he just got unlucky. Now back to this. Uh, one way 
how I can actually do this is by mapping Firefox into, or basically take, rather than Firefox, I now have Firefox Tensor Psi of X. So what I basically do is I take my, let's say, d-dimensional vectors, phi of x, and a d-dimensional vector, or maybe a d-prime dimensional vector, psi of x, and I take the pointwise outer product. Right? So this is now mapping into a space that is d times d-prime dimensions long. So more to the point, what I get is that if I have a tensor B, this is basically the vector, you know, A1, B1, A1, B2, up to, you know, A1, B, D prime, A2, B1, until you have A, D, B, D prime. And now if you have this ginormous vector, and you take an inner product with another one, you get exactly that notation. Because you basically have, a, have two double sums, and you can pull them out, and that's exactly what happens. Okay. Any questions so far? So this is the easiest way to prove this. There are a lot more complicated ways to prove it, using functional analysis and so on. But by just brute force explicit construction, that's probably the easiest way of getting it. Okay. By the way, what do you do if you have an infinite dimensional vector? Okay. Who knows? Okay. That's that would be. A very nice strategy. Basically, you perform a finite dimensional approximation, and then you just prove it for that, and then you make some limit transition. The other thing that you could do is you could basically just have a basis that can be enumerated, so basically a countable basis, and then you perform all the operations there. So who has heard of Hilbert's Hotel yet? OK. Those of you who haven't, uh, Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into much detail, but basically the story goes as follows. Here's one very large hotel with an infinite number of rooms, right? And so this is Hilbert's hotel. And what happens is that a new customer arrives at Hilbert's hotel. And he wants to find a room. And what happens then is he gets the first room. And the first customer goes into the second. The second goes into the third, and so on. And so this way, there is no, not a single customer that will end up without a room. Okay, This is a very nice metaphor on the notion of having countable sets. And you can basically do that type of construction for infinite dimensional spaces where I can, through that, add one extra dimension to it, right? I could just pad it in front. Now, if I have infinite times infinite, right? So maybe I have one infinity here and have another infinity there. So then, how do you show that this is also still countable? Well, you design an algorithm how to enumerate all those things and to traverse it, right? Okay, let me make this a little more clear. So what you do is you can just go through this one here, then there, then there, then there, and you just enumerate. And this way, again, you have something that's countable. So you can, for instance, use that to enumerate to show that fractions are also a countable set. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. 
And it's basically that type of constructions that you can also use when you take, you know, tensor operations between spaces. So this is exactly what we exploited here, right? So if these objects were infinite dimensional, right, then, you know, of course, infinity times infinity is still infinity. But what I can actually do is I can use exactly that construction here to get a countable basis again. Okay. This was an extremely sloppy overview of some basic concepts in functional analysis. So the big disclaimer is obviously go and talk to your friendly mathematician and read up on it because it's actually really, really nice. Okay, good. So with that out of the way, um, let's look at more conditions about kernels. So what makes a good kernel? One of the things is, of course, I need to be able to compute it cheaply. Because if I cannot compute it cheaply, well, I might as well not bother having a kernel, right? The entire goal is here computational efficiency as opposed to just mathematical beauty. The second thing is, if it's nice to compute but utterly useless in practice because it doesn't predict very well, then, again, it's not terribly effective, right? So I want to actually have, so to say, nice and useful functions where nice and useful means that whatever I get out of it in the end is, you know, sufficiently smooth and well behaved and doesn't overfit and all that. And a couple of obvious things is are, well, we already saw that k of x and x has to be greater or equal than zero and that the function k has to be symmetric. If it's not symmetric, then, well, good night. So the question is, you know, is there always such a feature map for any kernel k? And I guess we all know that there isn't. But then there is this very, very nice theorem. It's called Mercer's theorem, and it's, yeah, over 100 years old. So it's 106 years old now, um, which basically says that for any symmetric function k, which is square integrable, and which satisfies this condition here, So basically, remember how we wrote the inner product between matrix, vector, matrix. Sorry, vector, matrix, vector, right? So when we looked at sum over i and j, alpha i, alpha j, j, k, right? This is essentially the same thing here, just that the alphas are now played by, by the ifs, right? And this is now the function k evaluated at all points, right? And so if this is non-negative for all functions f, then it means that I can find essentially an eigenvector eigenvalue decomposition, except that the eigenvectors are now eigenfunctions. So the quick translation of going from linear algebra to functional analysis is whenever you talk vectors, you now call them functions. And whenever you talk matrices, you now call them operators. Right. That's a very quick and easy translation. And a lot of things go through nicely, and some things become strange. And again, talk to your friendly mathematician about what that really means. There's a lot of really beautiful things you can do here. And yeah, if you did physics, then you would probably know this stuff already quite a bit from quantum mechanics. So opening a quantum mechanics book will also help you understand this quite nicely. Yes? Um, not necessarily. Those things may still be countable infinite, but basically, Linear algebra, you go from finite dimensional things to then countable infinity. And yeah, a lot of things get very bizarre once you go to uncountable uh, spaces, but most operators, so for instance, you know, compact operators and so on. So you, you will do your, your best trying to be in countably infinite. Um, <clears throat> 
Also because what you want to be able to do is have a very nice handle on the complexity of function spaces. And so if your function space is way too rich, then you're not going to learn much. You're basically just going to memorize individual things. OK. So anyway, so we have those eigenfunctions, phi i. And what happens is that I can then write k of x and x prime as a sum over lambda i phi i of x. Right? And that, of course, means that I can write my feature map psi of x to be just this list square root lambda i phi i of x. Right. So I'm basically able to explicitly construct such a feature map. In some cases, this can actually be computationally advantageous. So for instance, if I have a Fourier basis, I can actually sometimes do interesting things with that. But that's quite a bit beyond the current state. And yeah, we already saw the matrix vector multiplication, so this is kind of straightforward. So distances are something that we didn't compute yet, but it's also straightforward if you already know the norms. So the distance between two points x and x prime is now just the distance between phi of x and phi of x prime. And then just plugging in linear algebra, I get the expression for the distance in terms of kernels. And then, yeah, we have a kernel matrix. And k is really like a similarity measure. So for instance, there are some kernels for which k of x in the x is always 1. <coughs> and in that case, of course, this term here, these two terms, simplify into 2. So we get that this equals. 2 times 1 minus k of x and x prime. OK. So basically, you can now see why k of x and x prime is sometimes also called a similarity measure. Because if k of x and x prime is very large, and in this case, well, we know that you know, the length of the vectors has to be bounded by 1, because that's exactly what we assumed here right? by imposing that. So it means if the similarity is very large, then those vectors point in almost the same direction. And so it's 1 minus that similarity that tells me the distance between those two points. OK. So let's actually do a little bit more explicit geometry. So suppose I have a kernel. And this kernel has the property that k of x and x equals 1. So from that, it follows that k of x and x prime has to be less equal than 1. Well, why does this follow? Because I know that this is the same thing as phi of x dot phi of x prime. And this is by Cauchy-Schwarz less equal than the norm of phi of x times the norm of phi of x prime. But this is 1, this is 1, and so we just proved it. Right? It's very easy. Now, the next thing that I, so it basically means that all those points have to lie on a ball in some very high dimensional space. OK, so some ball. Now, if furthermore, k of x and x prime are greater or equal than 0, then that means that no two points will be further apart from each other than at right angles, right? So there's always an acute angle between two points, or at very most a right angle. So that means that this entire space really is just a cone. Right? And now the distance between two points in the original space just gets mapped into this 
squish distance on that surface. We will actually see kernels that satisfy this property. As a matter of fact, you probably already used one of those, namely the radial basis functions kernel, except that they used it in a different context. We'll see that the Gaussian RBF kernel, again, is extremely popular here. So let me just quickly write out that function, and we'll see it in a lot more detail later. So that's given by e to the minus 1 half x minus x prime squared. And you can see that it satisfies all those conditions up here, because this is, of course, non-negative. And you can see that e to the 0 is 1, so it satisfies this. And so now you have basically a nice dissimilarity measure. And you can basically use as a distance d between x and x prime to be just 1 minus this. And you're done. OK. Any questions so far? Yep. So can you go the other way? Can you take your favorite distance metric and construct your kernel out of it with that formula? You can. Like you, you could sometimes, but not always. So there are distances for which this doesn't hold, and we'll see some examples. Um, in some cases, people have tried this, and it's, yeah, this was, there was a time of about five years when that kind of papers was extremely popular. So you would go and take a distance, you would prove it's a kernel, you would then use your favorite kernelized learning algorithm for it, and you would analyze its you know, smoothness properties. And those papers, yeah, there were probably about 10 of them. Yes? There's a, there's a take all on the third line of that. On the third line? Third line of the equality up there, the minus 2kx. Oh, yeah, it has to be a prime. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, otherwise it would be horrible. Yes, thanks. Good catch, especially from the last, last row. You've got good eyes. Thank you. Um, yes, so. So we already had the positive semi-definiteness. We already saw the kernel expansion, right? So we did this already. Uh, here's a question. Yes? So it is now that we determine the fate x first. So you can go both ways. So you can say, well, here's some phi of x. Let me get the kernel for it. You can do that. And sometimes this is a very good idea if you have explicit features. The problem is that in that case, it's going to be very unlikely that you'll get substantial computational savings by going from phi of x into x, right? So uh, in, into k. Find, a, find an easy to compute kx. Correct. Then you yes. say that it is Exa the inner product of some phi of x. Exactly. So what, ha what happens, that's exactly the, the, the way a lot of those engineering decisions are made, that you can go and say, well, here's a nice kernel with nice properties. And I want to prove that it's actually a proper kernel. And in some cases, this goes horribly wrong. So there's, for instance, one kernel that was used for, yeah, probably about 10 years. It's the infamous Tange kernel. So And people actually implemented this. So early support vector papers had that, or early implementations had that as one of their, quote, valid kernels. And it was like, well, you know, we ran it, and hey, it works sort of, kind of, and yeah, it's probably going to be OK. And yes, the tangent kernel often will give you situations where the smallest eigenvalues are not very negative. And well, we finally stopped this about yeah, 15 years ago by proving that under no circumstances, so under no dimensionality and no offsets, will this ever be a valid kernel. So we actually gave the analytic expansion of the corresponding eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, and we showed that some of the eigenvalues are negative. And that fortunately finally actually put an end to the tang kernel. So sometimes it can take a decade until Basically, you go and find 
the right paper from the 30s where people worked out these things in detail. Oh, okay. So, very good question. So the question was, what happens when one of the when some of the eigenvalues are negative? Well, so one of the things that may happen is you can get a optimization problem that is no longer convex, and will, you will end up with a local minimum. That's one thing. In some cases, if you want to minimize the length of a vector and you have a negative eigenvalue all of a sudden you might end up with negative vector lengths. And the optimization problem all of a sudden might diverge. So the ways in which something like this can go wrong are from perfectly benign where you don't even notice it because maybe your solver isn't perfectly implemented anyway to find the correct solution. And that was actually a little bit the case in the, in the beginning when people used the tang kernel. So essentially, they implemented the solver a little bit wrongly, and they actually also you know, used the wrong kernel. And well, two wrongs sort of kind of made a right. As soon as people started designing solvers that are actually able of finding the optimal solution really efficiently, um, these things started blowing up. <coughs> so um, yeah, basically, don't do it. Um, so let's look at a simple example where you would think that this might actually be okay. So, well, you could go and say, well, let's use as a distance something that is where the similarity is one. If the points are less equal than one apart from each other, and it's zero otherwise. So in other words, I have a lot. Let's say on a line, I have those three points, one, two, and three. And they are all equally equidistantly spaced. And so now I get this kernel matrix, this one here, which has exactly two zeros, namely for the pair 1, 3, and the pair and 3, 1. So this is symmetric. The main diagonal entries are all non-negative, so this is great. A first indication that something could possibly go wrong is if you look at it, this matrix is no, not diagonally dominant. So kernel matrices don't have to be diagonally dominant, but if they are, then you immediately know that they are kernel matrices. So diagonally dominant basically means that the main diagonal is larger than all the off-diagonal elements. That's actually not always a good idea to have, but anyway. And so if you do this, you'll see that, well, you get eigenvalues that are, one of them is negative. And you can either do this analytically, or you take this 3 by 3 matrix, and you throw it at Octave, and you get the result right away. And so this shows you that this is not a kernel. Yep? What is the minimum set of necessary and sufficient conditions? OK. So the necessary and sufficient conditions were exactly Mercer's theorem. This gives you the necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, well, symmetry is a necessary condition, yes. Um, but basically, you know, sure. But beyond that, if this integral is always non-negative, then it, you will have a kernel. Likewise, when you have a kernel, this integral will always be non-negative. Right. Now, the thing is, this condition is not always terribly easy to check. So this is why people have come up with specialized criteria for special types of kernels. So for instance, kernels that only depend on the distance between the two arguments, so where k of x and x prime is some function cap of x minus x prime, all you need to do is just Fourier transform it and check whether it's non-negative. And if that's the case, then you're safe. If you have a kernel that is basically given by the inner product between x and x prime, just a function of that, then computing a Taylor series expansion of that function will give you necessary and sufficient conditions if you do not restrict the dimensionality. If you do restrict the dimensionality, then rather than a Taylor series expansion, you'd have to expand things in terms of Legendre polynomials, and I'm fairly sure nobody here would want to do that. That's about as much fun as a root canal. So uh, that's exactly what you have Maple for.
right? Um, but that's, ba that's basically what you had to do to prove that the tangent kernel is, is bad. Yeah. So. And thank God for Maple. OK. So to find a counterexample is sometimes the easiest way to show that something is not a kernel. Basically, all you do is you just you know, try to pick some data, you check the eigenvalues. Okay. So does somebody have an idea what could possibly go wrong if you did that? Let's say you fire up MATLAB or Python or Octave, or you know, if you're hardcore, you write it directly in C++, but I'm not sure this is the fastest way of prototyping. Yep? If something is negative but very close to zero, Exactly. So what can happen is that if I have very, very small eigenvalues in absolute, in absolute magnitude, right, then the numerical issues may very well creep in. And so it may very well happen that some very small negative spurious eigenvalues occur just because I didn't have enough numerical precision. Likewise, I might miss some very small negative eigenvalues due to numerical issues. Um, that's something that could happen to you. And I've seen people sometimes get very confused when they deal with kernel matrices and they run eigen, and then sometimes this happens. But this is exactly why you also need regularization anyway afterwards to just make this problem entirely go away. OK, so here's a list of kernels. They're all bona fide kernels. So one of them is just you know, x dot x prime. Another one would be, and I should probably specify this, this should be the one norm here. And here you can have the two norm. So Laplacian RBF, where it's just x minus x prime, and you know, just summing over all the coordinate wise distances. I guess everybody knows the difference between a 1 and a 2 norm. Okay. That should have been covered in the recitation, right? The polynomials, we already did them. B splines are an interesting beast. So this, these are basically piecewise polynomial functions. So the simplest one is this one here. Okay, sorry. The next one would be this. The next one would be that. And now the resolution of my stylus is kind of at the limit. But basically what happens is that these are functions that are, would be quadratic here, quadratic there, quadratic there, and then zero otherwise. And you can easily see that actually these functions are given by repeated convolutions of, itself, of themselves. We actually saw them in the law of large numbers, right? Where we saw that, you know, basically just taking uniform distributions over the interval from minus 1 to 1 and convolving it gave us something that conver converged, to, converged to a Gaussian. Yes? Uh, would the third B-spline be smooth at the corners, or would it be more like an epinephrine? It would be actually smooth at the corners. And the interesting thing is that not all of them are actually proper kernels. More to the point, all the ones with, e with odd order are. So this would, be, this would be not a kernel. This is order 1. This is order 2. And remember, this, was, this is effectively the thing that we used for our counterexample, right? This was the basically, whenever the distance is less equal than 1, set the value to 1, otherwise set it to 0. This is not a kernel. If I convolve this thing by itself, I get this function out of it, and this actually will then give me a kernel. This is not a kernel. The next convolution up is a, it's a kernel again. Yes? Isn't that the so-called boxcar kernel that we did in the Yes, that is quite related to that. So the only difference is that now we are using the spectral properties of this beast, right? So this is now a Hilbert-Schmidt kernel as opposed to a smoothing kernel for a Watson-Adaria estimator. And 
This is a very popular common source of confusion where people mix up what's in the diary kernels and these kernels. So, for instance, you can have a polynomial kernel that doesn't look like a density at all. Likewise, you can have something like this, which is not a proper Hilbert-Schmidt or Mercer kernel, and that is you know, perfectly reasonable for kernel density estimation. So some kernels satisfy both conditions, but not all do. Yes? But why, so the, the logistic is not a kernel. So the tangent is not. But the Gaussian is. Yes. That's this guy here, right? What about the Lorentzian? Uh, what, what is the Lorentzian? I'm not sure I know it. Yes. So this, yes, that actually is also a kernel. Yes, but only for certain dimensionalities. Um, that has to do with if you Fourier transform it, you'll see that depending on the dimensionality, you will get negative, negative values. Because the integral is actually divergent for higher dimensions, right? So basically, just go to spherical harmonics, higher order, and you'll see immediately that the leading terms there will make the integral diverge. And that's basically what messes everything up. Very good suggestion. Yes. So this is the world's most boring. Yes? Um, does, do the conditions of Mercer's theorem hold for the other types of kernel? Are they a larger class? Or so Mercer's, Mercer's theorem has to hold for all. For all of them. OK. So that's more <coughs> but it just so happens that for certain classes, there are much easier conditions to, uh, to check. So every smoothing mm. kernel is a Mercer kernel, but not vice versa? No. They are, OK. So to say, this is, let's say this is the set of smoothing kernels. This is the set of Mercer kernels. And there is some intersection, but they're not the same. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, and many of the interesting functions fall into this. And this sometimes lets you build interesting bridges between algorithms and heuristics, which in one area where a heuristic, and then you go and actually say, well, by using some very different set of tools, you can actually now prove useful properties about it. This is useful, usually a very lucky find if you come across a heuristic in one area, and then all of a sudden you can actually prove things. People like that a lot, but it's not a given. OK. So. They, well, OK, so this is Mercer kernels. And these are smoothing kernels. And they have some overlap. Can you give an example? Well, what that is. OK, so this is an example of a kernel that's in the overlap. And this guy here is very clearly not a smoothing kernel, right? You would not even think in your worst nightmare to use this for a watson daria smoother, because it will actually give you negative numbers, right? So if you have a density estimate with negative numbers, well, uh, not good. Yeah. So, well, just plug something in, right? Let's say, OK, let, let's, let's do the math, right? It's very straightforward. Um, OK, let's just say I take c equals c equals 1. Let's take d equals 3. Right? Let's have x equals 1 and x prime equals, let's say, minus 5. Right? So x dot x prime is minus 5 plus 1 is minus 4. Because you, you use the angle bracket, it, did, it, did it not mean inner product? That is the inner product between two one-dimensional one vectors, right? So I've, I've just tried to keep things really simple because the stylus ha doesn't give me very fine resolution. So I have to keep my math simple. And so this is minus 5 plus 1 is minus 4. 
Now raised to the power 3, well, it's still negative, right? So there we go. So that's minus 64. OK, now a really useful trick is when you have a kernel that only depends on the distance between points, you just Fourier transform it and you're done. And this will give you necessary and sufficient conditions. So there's a paper that we wrote about 20 years ago on that very thing. Yes? Is that second point you brag at because C supposed to be there? Pardon? Is what? In the polynomial kernel? Yeah. The second bracket, there's another bracket after the C. Um, that shouldn't be there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have Emacs open when editing this. LaTeX it doesn't have that nice bracket closing semantic of Emacs. Anyway, the conditional expectation part is kind of cute, and at some point people made quite a killing out of that. Namely, if I have p of x given caused by c and p of x and x prime caused by c, then I can ask, you know, what about the joint probability p of x and x prime? And you can immediately work out that this is also a kernel. And why would that be meaningful? So for instance, in bioinformatics, you might have that C is the underlying original sequence from which two observed sequences, X and X prime, would have originated from. So, and yeah, the chocolates, awesome. Thank you. So Frodo gets the chocolate. And everybody else needs to pick it up next week. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, I'll actually check with the leaderboard afterwards again whether not somebody might have arrived during the class. So stay tuned. Um, but basically, what you might have is that the original underlying sequence is unknown. And then you can say, well, you know, in terms of evolutional, ev evolutionary similarity, well, you know, what are the chances that two observed sequences have the same ancestor? And you can use that directly to design a kernel and then, you know, use it for estimation. So David Hausland, uh, Tommy Jacola did a fair amount of work on that about 15 years ago. Okay, the world's most boring kernel, the linear function. Slightly less boring. This is k of x and y being this term here. It's just e to the x minus x prime. Right? Minus, of course, here. Now, the interesting thing is if you Fourier transform this, you will get something else that's also non negative. So, by the way, this is also a useful thing that you can do. You take some function like this, you Fourier transform it. And since we know that this th thing here was already non-negative, the Fourier transform it of it has to be a kernel. And that's actually what happened with the Lorentzian that, that was asked before, where it's just the Fourier transform of this. This is the Gaussian, and we already all know that the Fourier transform of a normal distribution is a normal distribution, so that's what happens here as well if you want to prove it. Polynomial of order 3, well, that's very clearly not a smoothing kernel because, well, those things can get negative, right? Uh, well, this should have been a straight line, but I guess you immediately see that this is what screws up any smoothing ambitions. B spline of third order. <clears throat> and it's, you know, piecewise quadratic. Basically, somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And that's what brings us to the end of chronology. Now, we've taken probably a lot more time with kernels than I expected, but I hope that at least it gave us a bit of an idea of you know how kernels work and so on. 
So next week we are going to cover support vector machines and other objects. Um, the Wednesday lecture that maybe by now would have finished uploading depending on bandwidth, well, that's basically something that you might want to look at. Okay, good. So leaderboard um, is Angry Bird homework for a lot of perfect totient or Xi'an in the room. Okay, you get the chocolate. So, who are you? Which team are you? Okay, good. There you go. And thanks for coming. I don't know. I drew.